My name's Lori Steiner. I am a partner in the law firm of Solomon Steiner and Peck, and I'm a certified elder law attorney. So I have the credentials to talk about this topic, and I do quite frequently. So we're going to be talking about Medicaid and how things have changed in 20 or have been changing and are continuing to change in 2021. There are some rules that you really got to pay attention to. I'm going to put up the Q&A box here so I can see if there are any questions. Also the chat box. If you could put them in Q&A, that would just be easier and you have only one place to look if you have questions as we go. But um, I would love to answer your questions as we go so that you, so I'd rather talk about what you wanna hear than what I think you wanna hear. So go ahead and put questions in the Q&A box and I will try to get to those as we go. It's just a little, about three minutes after 12, so why don't we get going? So obviously here we are, we're talking about Medicaid pre-planning, crisis planning, and the law. We are glad you are here. And why is this such a big deal? Why do people need to know about Medicaid and, and other ways to pay for long-term care? Well, the answer is it's a big issue. If you're age 65 to 69, you have a one in two chance of a nursing home stay. Now it could be just a short one to rehab from a, a surgery or something, but there's a lot of people with Alzheimer's who end up in the nursing home for a very long time. Average stay is about two and a half years, but some are shorter, some are much longer. The cost is really one of the biggest problems, $96,000 to $144,000 a year. And we're seeing people in, in the Cleveland area, it's creeping past twelve dollars and $13,000 a month in some of the nursing homes. So people are worried and they should be. 50% of all couples lose all their assets within one year because they didn't know what to plan for and how to plan for it. So that can cause financial devastation. And the programs aren't so simple to understand. So that's what I'm here for to try to break it down a little bit for you. So if you do go into a nursing home and the odds are at some point, many people do, how are you gonna pay for it? Obviously self-pay is what a lot of people end up doing. Once Medicare, we'll talk a shortly a little bit about Medicare, pays their part, you're kind of stuck with paying by yourself or figuring out other ways to do that. Some folks have private paid that they bought themselves long-term care insurance. Um, it's pretty expensive and I don't see all that many clients who have long-term care insurance. There's also some new hybrid policies for long-term care insurance out there. Rather than you just pay a, you pay a premium in order to have so much per day helping you pay towards long-term care, often either at home or assisted living or nursing home or daycare, a lot of different ways. Um, that's if, if you don't use it, you've lost all the premiums that you paid in. There are life insurance policies. There are certain annuities that are out there that you can tap into the benefits before you die to help pay for long-term care. And if you don't use it all up, then at least there's something left for the beneficiaries to get. There's veterans benefits in some cases. Some folks decide they want to stay at home and can't really afford in-home care for that long haul, so they take out a reverse mortgage. It's a way to tap into the equity in your home and borrow against the equity. And you, well, the, big, the big draw with a reverse mortgage is that you would be able to use the money without having to make monthly payments. When you pass away or leave your home, you have a year to get the house sold and the loan is paid back and any equity you still have in it can go to yourself or to your heirs if you've passed away. Medicare will pay some, but not all of a long-term care bill when you're in a facility, but Medicaid is the one program that really can help. So we're gonna focus a little bit on how that works. But first, where does Medicare stop and Medicaid begin? If you have a, an issue with going to, let's say you go to the hospital because you broke your hip or you had a stroke and you go to the hospital, um, Medicare of course will pay your medical bill. So pay the hospital bill. And if you are admitted to the nursing, admitted to the hospital for at least three midnights and a total of 72 hours, when you're released to a nursing home for that therapy that you need to get back on your feet, Medicare will cover up to 20 days in full. 
with up to an additional 80 days with a copay. And oh, that's last year's number. It's up to about $185 a day now for the copay. And usually your supplemental health insurance will pay that. Um, in order to get Medicare to pay any of it, you've got to have those three midnights in the hospital. That's how they count the days. Be in a Medicare licensed facility. You have to need the skilled care like therapy or rehab or oxygen or feeding tubes, things like that. And your bed has to be Medicare certified. After that 100 days, if you get the full 100 days, they like to try to kick you out sooner than that. Then either your private pay, you've got one of those other sources of getting some income or extra money around to pay for it, or Medicaid is the program that will really pay. So it, it is a government program. It's federally determined. So the law is federal, but then each state has their own rules that they have to um, set up and they have to follow the medical, uh, the, the rules that the federal government puts forth. If you look at all of the people in nursing homes, about 60% are private pay or have some other way of paying for it. And only about 40% of residents in nursing homes actually get Medicaid. And I think that's partially between, between the laws being very complicated and facilities making a lot more money from a private pay patient than they do from a Medicaid patient. So the facilities are going to suggest you use all of the money privately to pay as long as possible before they then say, okay, we'll help you with a Medicaid application now because you've run out of money. Um, there's planning you can do ahead of time, long before you go in the nursing home. There's crisis planning you can do even when you actually have to end up in a nursing home for good. So you don't have to spend down every last dime before you go in. But I think a lot of people think that's the case because that's what you hear when you go into a facility. The programs, particularly when you get down to making an application, applications are made county by county. And some counties are easier, some counties are harder to get through the process, but unfortunately it's, it is, should be do-it-yourself. I mean, it's really a program where people are supposed to be able to um, get these benefits as soon as they're eligible, but it oftentimes turns out not to be do-it-yourself. There's a lot of tricks and, and problems that happen. So now we're gonna go over the actual rules for the Medicaid program. So you got to be a U.S. citizen. Generally, you have to have what they call a limiting physical factor. You got to have something wrong. You got to have some illness. Oftentimes, they look at can you can you do activities of daily living, bathing, dressing, toileting, um, eating, and do you have continence issues? Do you have cognitive issues? There has to be something going on. So, and and what you're doing in the nursing home has to be medically necessary. I don't think that's a big deal. I don't know of many clients who want to be in the nursing home to begin with, and they just end up there because that's just what's necessary. Um, now, Medicaid does have several different programs. We mostly focus on nursing home Medicaid because that's traditionally the first place that Medicaid was available. And that's the most expensive and the hardest place to try to pay for. So we kind of focus on the nursing home part, but there is Medicaid available at home called the Passport Program that provides not money to pay um, like the, the room and board because there isn't anything, but it, it pays for people to come in and help out to, uh, anywhere from 25 to 40 hours a week. It depends on the care that you need. There's also Medicaid in some, but not all, assisted living facilities. That's called the Assisted Living Waiver Program. Both Passport and Assisted Living Waiver, what the waiver part is, they waive the requirement that you have to be in the nursing home in order to qualify for Medicaid. Originally, that was true. Now they opened up these other programs because Medicaid went, gosh, it's cheaper to keep somebody at home and pay for their care there or in the assisted living it's cheaper for the government to do that than to have them in the nursing home where the costs are much more, much higher. So it's a good idea, but it is difficult, particularly assisted living program is very difficult to qualify for that. So let's go through some of the rules. This is the single person rules, okay? There's income eligibility and there's asset eligibility. Under income eligibility used to be that if your income was less than the cost of the nursing home, 
And I don't have many clients where their income is higher. Although I did have one man, he was an, had been an executive at one of the big accounting firms in town. And his monthly pension was $11,000 a month, which sounds great. He could pay for whatever care his, he or his wife would need in a nursing home. But his wife was in the nursing home. She was so sick and had so many medical issues going on. Her monthly bill, private pay, was $29,000 a month. So he actually came to us to plan for a Medicaid application for her because he, he couldn't even afford to continue to pay that bill. So it, it just depends. But it used to be as long as your income was less than the cost of the nursing home, you could get Medicaid. Now they have an income cap. It's called um, the income cap means if your gross income exceeds $2,382, then you're not eligible for Medicaid unless you set up a special kind of trust. The abbreviation there is QIT. It's a qualified income trust. You have to run your excess money through this qualifying income trust in order to qualify for Medicaid. And a lot of people have no idea that that's the case. When you're making an application on your own and the caseworker takes three or four months to finally look through your documents and see whether or not you're eligible, and they realize your income is too high and you haven't set up this QIT back when you applied for Medicaid, you don't get Medicaid up until the time that qualifying income trust is actually set up and running the way it's supposed to. So you can lose a lot of months of, of Medicaid eligibility if you don't realize that there's now this income cap and you have to do something special and you have to, you have to set up this trust and actually use it in the way that they prescribe. Under the income rules, um, when you're in a nursing home getting Medicaid, most of your monthly income goes to pay the nursing home. That's called the patient share, the patient's share of cost or the patient liability. So you get your income each month. If you have too high of income, part of it has to go through this qualifying income trust. Then they add up all your income and you get to keep out of your income a personal needs allowance of $50 a month to pay for haircuts and laundry and whatever else you need. You get to keep your health insurance premiums that you need to continue to pay to keep your supplement in place or to keep your prescription plan in place. Uh, there's also a way if you have an unpaid medical bill from the past that you don't have the money to pay anymore, there's a way that they can run those through Medicaid to get them paid. For assets, when they're talking about how much in the way of assets you get to keep, assets are pretty much anything. Anything you could turn into cash and use to pay the nursing home, they're going to count. You can't have more than $2,000 in assets as a single person. That's typically a bank account with no more than $2,000. They do let you keep one car if it's necessary for your transportation. Doesn't mean you have to drive it, but if it's necessary even to drive you around. You're allowed to have a cemetery plot. You're allowed to have an irrevocable funeral contract. That means you pay the money, you can never get it back because you decide you're not gonna die. It's an irrevocable payment. And you get to keep your personal items. You get to keep your stuff. Okay, for a married couple, it's a lot more complicated. For income eligibility, Whose money is it? If you're married and you have a joint bank account and money's coming in from both of your social security checks or pension checks, how do they determine whose is whose? Because remember the one in the nursing home, just like a single person, the one in the nursing home, most of their income has to be paid to the facility as a part of the patient liability. So what they use is the name on the check rule. So any check that's got the wife's name on it is her income and any check that has the husband's name on it is his income. Again, it used to be if your income was less than the cost of the nursing home, you'd qualify. Now it's that income cap of $2,382. If the gross income of the one who is um, trying to get Medicaid exceeds that amount, then you have to set up a qualifying income trust to run that excess money through. Um, you also, the one in the nursing home, there's a 
calculation though, when it's a married couple, a calculation for how much out of the income that the Medicaid applicant can keep Again, it's the $50 personal needs allowance, health insurance premiums. In this case, health insurance premiums for both the one in the nursing home and the spouse who's living at home. That gets to be kept out of the nursing home spouse's income, the past due medical bills. And then there's something that's noted there is the MMMNA, <laughs> the minimum monthly maintenance needs allowance. If the spouse at home has so low of income that they're not gonna be able to make it on their own, on just their income, there's a certain portion of the nursing home spouse's income that be allocated to that spouse so that they can at least remain above poverty line while they're living at home. But it's not, nothing fancy, it's, it's not a whole lot of money. But once all of those reductions are made from the income of the one in the nursing home, the balance of that money has to be paid to the facility as the patient's share of cost or the patient liability. I did get one question. Can social security income be protected by a qualified income trust or QIT? It's not a matter of protecting any income. In fact, it, all you're doing is running money through. So let's say you have income of $3,382. So you're over the income limit by $1,000. All your money comes into your regular checking. The $1,000 that you're in excess of the income cap has to go into the QIT. Now what's left in your checking account where all your money came into is only $2,382, which makes you magically eligible for Medicaid. But you've got this extra $1,000 that's in the QIT. The requirement for the money in the QIT is that it has to be spent on your medical care within the month it went in. So it's just a sort of way of separating out your money between two pots and then still having to spend it. So you don't protect any assets in a QIT, social security or otherwise. It's just a method of, I think, making things harder for people to qualify for Medicaid. Um, it's just a, a way to put the money in two pots to become eligible on your income, and you still have to spend that income that's in the QIT to pay for either the facility or other health expenses or to cover the $50 a month you get to keep. So you don't really protect anything with the QIT. It's just a way of shifting money around. Okay, for a married couple, asset eligibility. Again, a little bit more complicated than a single person. Um, they add up all of your assets as the first day that you went into the facility. You get to keep off the top one car, one house, and we're gonna to get to more details on houses in the sack. One house, if there's one spouse living in it, the cemetery plot, the irrevocable funeral, your personal items off the top, whatever's left over is called um, the countable assets. And of those countable assets, the spouse who is in the nursing home gets to keep $2,000, just like they're a single person. And the one who's not in the nursing home gets to keep half of the assets that fall between 26,000 approximately and 130,000 approximately. So let's say you've got countable assets of 25,000. Half would be 12,500, but that's too little. You get to keep 25,000, almost the whole minimum amount. If you have assets that are say 100,000, countable assets, once you take off the things that are allowable, half is 50,000. So you get to keep, the spouse at home keeps 50,000 and has to spend or do something with the other 50,000. If you got 500,000 worth of assets, half would be 250, but that's too much. The most the spouse at home can keep is about 130, and then you've got to plan with the rest of it. And prenuptial agreements don't count. Even if you have a prenuptial agreement that says husband's assets are husband's, wife's assets are wife's, and they don't have to share between the two, Medicaid doesn't care. They treat you as though they're any other married couple, and you have to mix those assets together to determine how much you get to keep. Okay, so houses, and this is an ever-changing rule. 
it used to be that if you had your house in a revocable trust, it counted against you somehow because it was like you didn't actually own it, that the trust owned it. But that was completely against trust law and estate planning law. So now you can have your house in a revocable trust and it's still going to be exempted if you're a married couple with one spouse living there. If you're a single person and you still have a house, maybe you tried to stay at home and you used up all your money paying for that house. Um, or paying for your care at home, and now you had to go into the nursing home and you still got no money because you used it all, but you still have your house. There's This is a relatively new law. The house can still remain exempt if you have an intent to return home. And that's reflected by just having a letter go at the time of the Medicaid application saying, I know I'm in this nursing home now, but I intend to return home. So please exempt my house so I have some place left to go. So that will get you Medicaid while you are in the nursing home. And the house will sit there. Not always a good idea for a house to sit, but it can sit there. The problem is if you die and you are on Medicaid, you pass away and you still have that house sitting out there, you're not intending to return to that house anymore. So Medicaid's position is, well, we let you keep that house while you were getting benefits. But now that you're gone, you don't need that house anymore. You're not going there. So now we expect your family to sell the house and repay the, the Medicaid program in Ohio under what's called the Medicaid Estate Recovery Program, repay them for all these wonderful Medicaid benefits that you got while you were alive and we let you keep your house. So yes, you keep it, but it's a two double-edged sword. There are ways you can give away your house and not have it count as a problem for Medicaid. If you have a child who lives with and cares for a parent for at least two years before the parent went into the nursing home, the house can be given to that. Some paperwork, some hoops to jump through, but it's a way to protect the house. If there's a disabled child who, who is living in the house, it can go to that child outright or into a special trust, can also go as far as a disabled grandchild living in the house. Also, if it's a sibling living in your house, so let's say it's two sisters and they inherited the house from mom when she died and the two sisters have always lived there and they own the house half and half, and one sister has to go into the nursing home, the other, that house can be transferred, that half interest from the nursing home sibling can go into the name of the non-nursing home sibling so that at least that sibling living in the house doesn't lose their house because the one had to go to a nursing home. So there's things we have to do, some steps we have to plan with. Um, we don't want the house in the name of the spouse in the nursing home. We, 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 there are titling issues. We have to watch out for probate laws, we have to watch out for these state recovery laws. So yes, we can protect the house, but there's a lot of hoops to jump through. So you have to be careful of those. Okay, IRAs, this is really cutting edge. This is stuff that's changing as we speak and we still don't know the exact way that they're gonna look at the IRAs now. It used to be that an IRA counted as an asset because it was money you could access, even if you had to pay taxes on it to get the money out and make it liquid so that you could you know, um, use the money, they would count the IRA. So if you had a $100,000 IRA, you had a $100,000 asset. The new law now that they're doing is, if you've got that $100,000 IRA and you are above the age where you have to start taking required minimum distributions, used to be 70 and a half, now it's 72. So if you are in the age range where you're taking required minimum distributions that the IRS makes you do, then they're going to count the income you have each month under those income rules I talked about. And most of it goes to pay the facility, but they're going to leave the $100,000 asset alone. It won't count against you. So it's a way to protect additional assets. Again, here's the kicker. At death, we think, we do not know yet, we think that Medicaid estate recovery will treat the IRA just like the house example that I mentioned, and that when you die and that income stream isn't coming out 
as a part of your income to pay the nursing home each month, they're going to say, well, we let you keep that pot of money. We let you keep that $100,000 IRA, but now that you're dead, we want to come after it to repay the state for all these wonderful Medicaid benefits. That is what it appears to look like at this point, but they're not done with the regulations yet. Um, I actually sit on a committee of elder law attorneys who work with the state of Ohio um, legal policy department, and we work on issues where people are having trouble with Medicaid or rules are, in, are not complete or there's questions that come up and people don't know, or the caseworkers in, in each county are not processing things correctly. And I have, we've talked to them about the IRA rules. There's a lot of complications and a lot of questions about it. What if you're single and it's your IRA? Okay, the pot doesn't count, the income does. Can you leave it to a child when you die or is Medicaid gonna come in and take it? What if you're a married couple and it's the husband who's in the nursing home and it's his IRA and normally he would have left his wife as the beneficiary. When he dies, is Medicaid gonna come and take it or will his wife be allowed to then take out required minimum distributions until she dies? And then will they take it or will they let it alone and let it go to the kids? Um, there's so many issues going on. They're taking months to figure out the regulations that we have to follow. So this is one that's ever evolving and it, it is an important rule to look at. We're seeing more and more folks with larger retirement accounts now. If you're too young, there's still a way to get the same kind of result, but you have to annuitize your IRA, which means the pot of money is gone. It's now turned into an income stream each month that will be coming to you. And if you're single, it's yours. It's a part of the patient's share of cost to the facility. If you're married and say it's the husband's IRA and it's annuitized, there are ways that you can buy certain special kinds of annuity contracts where you can change the name on the check Remember I talked about the name on the check rule. If it's the husband's IRA and he gets the check and he's in the nursing home, then those payments for the most part are going to the facility. But there's certain contracts you can enter into where you can change the name on the check. It's still the husband's IRA, but he has the check go to his wife. So she gets the checks. She's not constrained by those same income rules and she can use that money while the pot underneath the, the IRA underneath what's issuing those checks is still exempted. Um, so there's a lot of things that are going on with IRAs right now that we have to keep track of. Gifting is an option that we often use to try to protect the assets. It is bound by this five-year look back period. So if you make any gifts within five years of making an application, when they look back five years to see on all your bank records, what did you do when they found that you gave away some money? It's a problem. So what they do is let's say that you apply for Medicaid, your money's all gone, you're down to nothing and you apply for Medicaid, but you gave away $50,000 to a child four years ago. That's within the five-year look back. So they go back and they look at what did you do in the last five years? Oh my gosh, you made it a $50,000 a gift to your child, we don't like that. We think you did that in order to qualify for Medicaid. And maybe you did, or maybe your son just needed $50,000 for a new house, doesn't matter. They take any gifts within that five years, in this case, 50,000, they, they, they wanna penalize you for a number of months that Medicaid won't pay. And that should be equivalent to how many months that 50,000 would have paid if you kept it and used it to pay the nursing home. So they take the 50,000 divided by the average cost of one month in the nursing home, which is $6,905. That's the average of all the nursing homes in the state of Ohio. They have to have a standard number. So when you divide that out, it's about seven months. And that seven months only starts when you apply for Medicaid because your money's all gone and they see that the gift was made and then going forward, starting for the month of application, they deny Medicaid payment to the nursing home for seven months. 
We can use gifting and planning, but it's a little bit more complicated. So how do you plan? Here's all kinds of different things that we talk about when we're in a meeting. Spending all your money down. Spending down on things that are exempted. Gift and give away your money and don't apply for Medicaid for five years. If you're at a crisis point, whereas well, most of the time where we see people, we have to look at the IRAs, we have to look at the house, we have to look for disabled children. Um, we got to see what can we do to protect as many assets as possible. Sometimes we make a gift of some of the money that'll cause a penalty period, but use the rest of the money through an annuity to pay for the penalty period. That's probably the high end complicated planning, but it's very specific. It's very personal. Um, it, every family is a little bit different in what they make up what their money is made up of and what they should do. And the Medicaid rules always are changing and they don't give us a whole lot of, lot of um, notice. So kind of, this has been a lot of information all at once, but you know, what do we do now with this information or how do you plan for the future? You need to ask about how Medicaid works. You know, look at Medicaid information don't trust the Department of Jobs and Family Services or the internet. People are going to tell you all the time, but I'm always having clients coming in. Well, I Googled this and this is what the rules are. Maybe, maybe not. Um, every state is different. Every county interprets things slightly differently. You're really better off having a professional, like an elder law attorney like me, help you out. It should be you do it yourself to handle a Medicaid application. Unfortunately, it oftentimes doesn't turn out that way because the caseworkers don't understand their rules they're supposed to follow. The rules are in flux. We don't even know how the IRA rules are going to end up. So it's more of a plan ahead, understand what's going on, start planning early. We have a significant amount of clients who decide to, while they're still healthy and think they got a good five years in them, um, give away the money to children or to a trust. We do a lot of planning to try to protect those assets for the parents for the rest of their life. But after five years, at least what was given away no longer counts when it's time for a Medicaid application. And most of these planning tools, you really got to have somebody who knows what they're doing set them up. At the same time that you're investigating elder law, then you still, you got to have a will. Estate planning documents are still important. You got to have a will, financial power of attorney, healthcare power of attorney, living will, sometimes, not always, a trust agreement to either avoid probate or an irrevocable trust agreement to hold assets that are going to be protected for Medicaid. The financial power of attorney is the one single document we update more often than anything else. Um, and those laws change very frequently as well. There are Medicaid provisions we have in our financial power of attorney. Right now, the laws are in the midst of change of who can sign a Medicaid application for someone. I mean, if it's your application, you can always sign it, but it's not always possible. You might be ill or have dementia and can't sign it. So who can sign it? If it's gonna be a financial power of attorney, Medicaid wants in the financial power of attorney language that allows that power of attorney to sign as an authorized representative for a Medicaid application. That's not in there. You can't sign by power of attorney. Can a spouse sign? Probably, especially when they're a married couple and it, both of their assets are being looked at for Medicaid. But if you're single, who are you going to have sign? Um, it, it's becoming much more difficult even to make the application. They bounce them back if the right person hasn't signed. The QIT trust I talked about, in order to have your power of attorney be able to set that up for you, that, uh, that ability to set up that trust has to be in the financial power of attorney. So as the Medicaid rules change, the power of attorney has to change. As the banking rules change, the power of attorney for finances has to change. So I re we recommend every three to five years you have your documents checked out. It might even be more often than that with the financial power of attorney. We have to sometimes update one that was done two or three months ago because it wasn't done correctly or the person chose to use the statutory form, right? Ohio has a statutory form and is not what you should choose as your financial power of attorney. It doesn't have all of these extra bells and whistles in there. So I got a comment 
that said, firmly agree, had multiple discussions with Job and Family Services about my daughter with a disability. Each time one rep contradicted the other. Yeah, we get that a lot. <laughs> so um, that's kind of all I wanted to go over. A lot of information, kind of a broad brush because we'd have to be here all day or maybe longer to get through all of those rules and any kind of depth. Um, at this point, if anybody else has any questions they want to pop into the Q&A or into the chat, I'm happy to, to answer them. Otherwise, we would be done for today. Um, what's going to happen at, after this is over, those of you who attended and, and even those who, who signed up but were not able to, we're going to send a copy of our, the PowerPoint out. And we encourage you to start planning if you're here because you want information. Um, then it's important to get that information. So I've got a question, what do you charge? So normally if we have a meeting on, especially when it's including estate planning and Medicaid and oftentimes veterans benefits, we talk about that too. Um, this was specifically focused on Medicaid, but um, I've done other presentations on how VA works to help provide um, money for at home care or, or facility care. Um, it takes about two hours because there's so much information we need from you to start with, family information and what documents do you have in place and your assets and your income so that we can say, okay, based upon all of this, these are the kind of things you have to worry about. These are the documents you need to update certain ones, maybe not all of them. If you're a veteran, this is how that process would work and what the asset and income limits are. For Medicaid, this is what we could talk about. Maybe we can plan ahead because you're still pretty young and healthy. Maybe we're at the middle of a crisis because mom just went into the nursing home. We, we plan with what your assets are. It, it takes a long time. It takes about two hours. So normally we charge $375 for that time, but we also have our friends and family discount for folks who come to the seminars, for folks that are referred by other clients and stuff, we charge only $275 for that meeting. Uh, haven't been doing much in-person meetings in last year, um, as for reasons that you all, I'm sure, are aware. We're just getting to where it's getting comfortable. Most people are getting vaccinated now, but we do a lot of Zoom meetings. We also do telephone conferences and, and getting a little bit back in the office a bit more now. So we can set up a meeting if you want to do that. You just call the office and talk to Debbie. And she can set you up with a meeting to talk more about you personally. A seminar is so impersonal. We, you, know, you can't get detailed information about yourself uh, or about what you need to do. Uh, but in those meetings, we spend the time talking about you and your assets and your family and your planning and your health. And where do you go for information about what Medicare plan you know, supplement plan to choose and what assisted living is the best one for you. And you can go to, what is that one? There's like care for mom or something like that. It's not very personal. There are personal agencies in the Cleveland area who know our facilities and have been in them and can help you choose between them. So there, there's a whole lot of information out there. And we try to be the bringer of that kind of information to everybody that we meet with. So all right, somebody said thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> Any other questions? Otherwise, I will kind of turn things down. Oh, somebody raised their hand, but I can't call on you because it's there's no um, audio. You have to type it into a question and answer or chat box. Oh, just a thank you. You're welcome. That was nice. Okay. Since we're getting close to 45 minutes and it was supposed to be only a half an hour, um, we probably should end this. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. And here I am again, thank you very much for attending. Look for an email from us in the next couple of days with a copy of the, the slide presentation and please call the office um, to make an appointment if you wanna talk about any of the stuff we talked about in this webinar. Otherwise, I'm just going to end things here and thanks so much and have a very good rest of the day. Keep warm for that snow that is supposedly coming out overnight. I'm not happy about that at all. Neither are you, I'm sure. Thanks. Bye-bye.